Hey, thanks for downloading Cross Defense. I got my buddy, Pastor Flammy, on this week to talk about his dad just retired from 25 years of ministry, one place, longer ministry, and he was there thinking about it, and we were thinking about that in the context of John chapter 10, all the pictures that Jesus paints for us in that chapter. It's a fantastic conversation. Thanks for thanks for downloading it, for being part of it here, for igniting your own theological imagination. Love to hear the feedback from you. It's all at wolfmuller.co, and, uh, and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, host of Cross Defense. <laughs> that's, that's a, I think that's an obvious thing. And we gather here every week to talk about the Lord's Word, His kindness, His mercy to us, which is new to us all the time. There's a freshness and a, even a surprise to the Lord's kindness. I mean, we know, we know we, what we deserve from God, His wrath, His judgment, His casting us aside. And instead, He says, look, I... I, I forgive your sins. I delight in you. I'm not. Ma- this is Isaiah 12. Though I was angry with you, my anger has been turned away. Can you believe it? So this is so to excite the the, the imagination with the joy of the Lord's word. And and to that end, I've got with me on the air t- on the line today, Pastor Brian Flammy, uh, pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in in Roswell, New Mexico. Normally we have an opening monologue, but Pastor Flammy and I were talking earlier today. I said this is we we're going to need it. We always run out of time. Let's just do the whole show talking about. Talking about this stunning promise that Jesus gives where he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So that's what we're going to talk about. Pastor Flamey, how are you? Hey, I'm pretty good. Uh, I was wondering, isn't Cross Defense supposed to be an apologetics show? Yeah, I'm sorry to our audience that you're, that you're <laughs> on as our guest. That's the, yeah, that's isn't right. that what apologetics uh-huh. mean? Yeah, uh, no, apologetics means that uh, we defend the Christian faith. And uh, anyways, what I was going to say is it's really nice that Jesus sets himself up as the apologetic for his church, you know, by laying down his life for the sheep. He is the good shepherd, and he defends us from the wolves. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here to talk huh. about this, this this week. You know, that, now that's something. I should fi- I should probably find a guest who has written his master's thesis on apologetics and have him on sometime. If, if you know of anybody like that, Pastor Flammy, uh, then let me know. Uh, so yeah, that would I'll be let great. You know. if but I uh, figure out who that is. No, no, no worries. <laughs> I, by the way, uh, to our listener here, this is an inside joke because Pastor Flammy finished his thesis, and I was supposed to help publish the thing. And he's he keeps sending me these gentle reminders. Hey, uh, hey, Pastor Wolfman, there. But anyway, to buy the, you should know that your manuscript is sent off to the editor today to be to be laid out as a book. It's it, his his thesis is called "Apologetic Opportunism," and then like a, another paragraph long title. But I cut that out. It's just called now op, "Apologetic Opportunism." That's what the book is going to be called, by the way. Oh, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> You you have to say that because we're live on the radio. But but now this is something I never had thought about, Pastor Flammy. Because so normally we think of the defense of the faith as a courtroom sort of thing, uh, like a defendant. So someone is, is is and and we have that all through the scriptures. This is amazing. So, so let me let me kind of shake this out of my mind here, and then you can you can tell. so so like Paul is standing before the uh, the guy in in Corinth you know the brother-in-law of Seneca or, or he's standing before Festus or he's there's these there's these courtroom scenes even Jesus before Pilate it's a, it's a por- it's a courtroom scene and we normally think of apologetics like a defense in that sort of setting but you're right the good, the shepherd defends the sheep and that's a much different kind of defense. When you think of, like, David, the shepherd David, defending his flock, he's not there making an argument with the wolf. He's throwing rocks at its face. It's, it's, but that's also a defense that's being offered there. And I, I, but I never imagined apologetics in that sort of, with that picture or that context. Yeah, I, I, it is a real defense. It's a real apologia. I mean, you can't, it, it does switch the metaphor from the courtroom uh, probably to the pasture, right? Uh, and yet it's a real defense uh, because, you know, Jesus puts himself on the line. Not only does he put himself on the line, he lifts himself up from the earth by his crucifixion. And what happens as a result is that the sheep are saved. 
Not only are the sheep saved, but they're then fed for an eternity, and they're provided for, and they're kept safe from all the attacks of the wolves from that point forward, as long as they have the voice of their good shepherd preaching to them from their, their cross, you know? And so this is, is the apologetics by means of rod and staff, like in Psalm 23. Uh, you have the weapon of the left and the weapon of the right hand, which I think would be our law and gospel. And by the, the means of the law, Jesus says, yes, you are blind, you are sinners. And by means of the gospel, which is the preaching of his own death, uh, the life that he laid down on behalf of the sheep, the sheep are saved. Uh, and so it's a much more visceral picture. And, uh, and I think that pictures are very important for this chapter in John, because Jesus keeps on switching the picture, trying to get the point across to a particular audience, which are the Pharisees who are angry at him for healing a blind man on the Sabbath. I want to... Boy... There's a lot there. Okay, so okay, but let's maybe we'll get to it because because this is a stunning sort of thing. Is that you normally think of the rod and the staff? The, the, the shepherd is defending the sheep with his power, with his strength, with his kind of shepherdly abilities, like King David, you know, who sat out in the field all day throwing, slinging rocks and knocking leaves off trees so that he could fell the lion, and at last he could fell. So so you th- you think of that kind of you you know sort of. <laughs> the shepherd has good aim. That's why we're safe in his care. But Jesus is going to say, no, the, the defense that I provide for you is not in killing the enemy, but in being killed myself. But but let's let's work towards that. So so you talk about we're talking about John chapter ten, the great good shepherd chapter, and you're and you're right. I had I hadn't articulated it that way too. But the, Jesus does keep kind of changing metaphors because he has these different points of comparison. So it, for, he starts out comparing, for example, he starts out comparing himself to the door. Is that so? You want to just walk through these different pictures that Jesus is using? Yeah, I would like to do that, to walk through the pictures. Uh, But first of all, a little bit about the context. I think this is important, because the problem leading up to this point, this conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees, concerns spiritual sight and spiritual blindness. And of course, there was this great comparison between this blind man in chapter 9 who had nothing until Jesus sent him to regain his sight. And then, he had, and then he lost Jesus again because Jesus, uh, 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 because he was taken away and questioned by the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And then after he had been cast out, um, after, after they had tried to get him to speak against Jesus, but he wouldn't, Jesus finds him again and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind man says, Well, t- who is he? Where can I find him so I, so I can believe in him? And then Jesus says, I am he, right? And, that, and then the blind man worships, and he says, I believe, Lord. And that, and that the Pharisees apparently see something of this, because they come to Jesus, and, and, they, uh, uh, and then Jesus calls them blind. And, and, uh, and he even says that because they say that they see, which I think means because they say that they perceive spiritually, they still are in their guilt. They are still in their sins. And then he launches into this description of how to regain spiritual sight, which is faith in Jesus, saving faith in Jesus, and uh, knowledge of not only the law, which the Pharisees knew very, very well, but spiritual sight gained by the gospel, that is, by God's undeserved mercy, the same kind of mercy that the blind man had received from Jesus. And so Jesus begins with the first metaphor. He says, I, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So there is a correct way into the people of God, right? And there are illegitimate ways into uh, to, to to get into uh, the uh, uh, the flock of God's people. Uh, so Jesus introduces the pastoral narrative of the sheep pen, and there's a gate through which, or a door through which, uh, uh, the the the, the uh, you know the leader of the sheep or the shepherd would go through. 
But that doesn't mean that there are others who are trying to get in and to uh, subvert the good thing that the sheep have within the pen. Uh, and, and what's funny about this is that Jesus starts with the metaphor of the door, and then he switches then to the doorkeeper, right? Hmm. Uh, and, he's, and then he says in verse 3, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. So the, uh, Jesus is both, <laughs> it, 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 it fluctuates a little bit here. So Jesus is the door. Uh, Jesus is uh, also is the, uh, the gatekeeper, and he is the voice. And, the, mm-hmm. and, and it, it is the voice that leads the sheep into the protected pasture and leads them out again. He uh, is the access to uh, God's kindness, I think is what Jesus is, is trying to get across to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are listening to him, and St. John says they don't get it. <laughs> no, right, that's right. That, that Jesus used this, this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. It, it, it was almost as if uh, uh, they ought to be thinking immediately about the famous passages from the Scripture that describe God's shepherding activity uh, and access to God's kindness and mercy and kingdom through his shepherding. So like Jeremiah chapter 23 which speak about the shepherds of the New Testament, and not just one in particular, but many of them. Of course, before that is Psalm 23, David's great uh, preaching concerning the Lord being the shepherd. And that same uh, 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 sermon by David is reiterated by Ezekiel in chapter 34 of his, of his prophecy, which talks about the false shepherds who try to lead falsely and, uh, and gorge themselves on the sheep and abuse the sheep, and because of this great abuse that is coming from the hands of these false shepherds, the Lord himself is going to become the shepherd. And the Lord himself, uh, the shepherd, is identified with the Messiah, the Christ, uh, the, uh, uh, the son of David, which is a very important prophecy that Jesus is saying to these Pharisees that I am fulfilling right now. That's right. Uh, so hey, by so, pointing to these, I think, three specific places in the Scriptures, they ought to be putting the picture together in their mind, and yet Jesus gets more and more specific as it goes. So, so do you think now? So, there's a couple of things to pick up on there. Um, so, one is this ancient picture, which so I think I understand this better this year than any. Is that the the way this would work in the ancient world? Is the shepherds would they'd take their sheep out during the day, and they'd wander around and look for for grass to eat or something to drink and they'd they'd take the sh- sheep out to feed and then they'd bring them at, back and you had a you had in the village like a community sheep pen and all the different flocks would sort of mingle together at night and they would hire someone to to stand and watch over all the different flocks and then in the morning the shepherd would come and he'd call his sheep and he'd call them by name you know Fred and Jeff and Susie and whatever and they and th- those sheep would hear the voice of the shepherd so that he'd lead them out of that kind of community pen and he'd take just his sheep out to wander around in the wilderness to get some grass for the day. And the same thing was happening like that. So you you have to imagine this big kind of crowd of sheep and all these shepherds there calling and all the sheep dividing up into various different flocks according to the voice of their shepherd. And and so this is, this is the picture that Jesus is referencing there. And he's saying that... Um, that I am this shepherd and I'm calling my own sheep, but that there's, but that there's only, in this way, is like one way in to do that rightly. So every, so all the other guys who are coming in and trying to call the sheep or jumping over the fence trying to steal the sheep or whatever, they're all illegitimate. And and Jesus is lumping the Pharisees in with the illegitimacy of the false shepherds. Th- this is the. The, the, yeah, the reference I, to Ezekiel I think the idea 34. Is that they're trying to get access to the sheep pen, but illegitimately. The only way to access the sheep and the protection that they have that you were talking about. By the way, how do you know any of this uh, concerning the sheep? Did you go and sit in Israel watching the sheep for a while? Or? When I went to Israel the first time when I was 19, I said, one of the things I want to do is go and live with the Bedouins and figure out how they would do this thing. And so we were driving along on the bus, and they, we drove by this Bedouin camp. And I thought to myself, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that is rough, man. Whew. Living in these black goat ski- goat w- woven goat wool tents and stuff. Yeesh. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. When I uh, was in Kuwait the very first time, and uh, I thought to myself, finally, I get to see how the people live in the desert. 
But, of course, in Kuwait, you have a bunch of these hyper-rich oil shakes. And so they, on the weekends, they take their whole family out into the sand dunes, and they erect these massive tents, which are basically palaces. And then they drive four-wheelers up and down the dunes all day and bring out the camels and race them and stuff like this. That's great. Uh, yeah. Not exactly what we discovered in the Holy Scriptures. I there was, we were, we, the last time we were in Israel, we were there, and there's this, this, this shepherd on the side of the hill. It was amazing. To, he's wearing his sandals. He's got his turban on. And he's, he walks this way. He walks like three steps to the side, and the sheep f- look up, and they, they take like three steps over there, and then they start eating. And then he'll walk up the hill a little bit to the left, and the sheep look up. And, they, and then one wanders too far, and he throws a rocket in front of them, and they go back, and the dogs are over there. And I thought, this is what it must have been like. I mean, I'm watching a shepherd from from like 3000 years ago i'm i'm seeing what jesus was talking about and we're in awe of this picture in front of us and then the guy pulls out of his pocket his cell phone <laughs> <laughs> oh you got to be similar. kidding me uh, oh, man. Uh, i mean everybody has cell phones now right and, and nevertheless i thought it was amazing uh when i was in iraq you know we'd be moving through city streets either on foot or in car and as we were moving around people there was always traffic people are are moving from one place to another. People have animals that they're trying to get from one place to another. Well, some of those animals are yoked, and they're being driven or pulled, but never the sheep. They weren't Mm. yoked in that same sort of a way. Instead, all you had was a little shepherd, some scrawny-looking 12-year-old boy at the back with a long switch, and he would stand at the back of the flock and just switch the sides from time to time to keep them moving in the right direction. Mm. It was amazing that all it took was... A little bit of prodding and a little bit of uh, and very gentle adjustments to take this massive flock of sheep through city streets out into whatever pasture is to be found in a place like Iraq, I suppose. That's you're listening to the voice of Pastor Brian Flaming. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, and this is Cross Defense. We're going to go to a break now, so let's go to the break, and we're going to come back and and press a little further into the images of John 10, Jesus' Good Shepherd passage. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about the gate? The, the watchman, the hire. What is the difference between the thief and the hireling? Who's the wolf? And why is it that the good shepherd is laying down his life for the sheep? More on that after the break. Stay tuned. You're listening to Cross Defense. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org slash careers. This week on Issues Etc., we'll have Pastor Tom Baker lead us in a Sunday school lesson on Jesus healing Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. We'll continue our series on Lutheran catechesis, talking with Pastor Peter Bender about the first article of the Creed and man's fall into sin, and we'll discuss confession and absolution with Pastor Paul McCain. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The prophet Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. Begin and conclude your day with the word that accomplishes the purposes for which it is sent. Morning prayer at 7 a.m. and evening prayer at 5 p.m. Weekdays on KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. The broadcasts of morning prayer and evening prayer are underwritten by Lutherans for Life.
Hey, hey, welcome back to CrossFit. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of Hope Luther Church in Aurora, Colorado. More theology at wolfmuller.co. I have with me Pastor Brian Flammy, recent author of, oh, what is it called again? How come I forgot? Uh, Apologetic Opportunism, soon to be a book, <laughs> and pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Roswell, New Mexico. We're working through John 10. We're headed somewhere with this. We're working through John 10 and the preaching of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. We got to the picture of the shepherd, the sheep pin, the door, the, the, the thief and the robber. Uh, what, and, then, and then you pointed out that Jesus is pulling in this preaching of Ezekiel who says to the shepherds, that's the priests and the, and the kings, the people who should be taking care of the people. He says, you guys are terrible shepherds. Instead of feeding the sheep, you're feeding on the sheep. You're slaughtering the sheep for your own for your own." well-being you're getting fat on the sheep so i'm going to i'm going to punish you shepherds the lord says and i myself will shepherd the sheep and i will lead them in and out and i will gather them from the places where they've been scattered and so forth so the lord promises to be the good shepherd and jesus comes along and says i'm the shepherd and you are pointing out pastor flammy that they should have recognized the warning of ezekiel 34 but they did not know what he was saying so then what happened what does jesus do well instead of calling himself merely the legitimate access point to the sheep, right, uh, the place in which people can safely come and gather the sheep uh, at, at, uh, or, or speak the voice that the sheep will know, uh, Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And uh, so the thing is, so we, we, like, I, I like the comparison that you brought up before. Uh, there's the thief and the robber who desire to attack the sheep. And those would be very analogous to, in Ezekiel chapter 34, like you were talking about, uh, the priests and the, and the kings and the princes who ought to have been caring for the people, but instead they were feeding upon them, right? Uh, at the, and so, so they were motivated by malice and by almost a hatred of the sheep uh, uh, to satiate their self-love. And uh, if anything, we ought to recognize in that a kind of demonic attack. It's not just fear that compels people to act in this way, uh, but it's also a hatred towards the things that God speaks in and uh, that he loves. Well, say so, say uh, something more about that, because we know, because this is something I kind of try to poke into a little bit to understand, because we normally think if a person's an unbeliever, it's, it's, because, of, it's because of ignorance, but there, but that's not the case. I mean, it's there's a there's an unbelief of hatred. There's an unbelief of anger. There's an unbelief of rejection. The devil believes these things about God. He just hates God. So it's not like it's like the person that that believes that Jesus is the Christ, and therefore you become a Christian. That's there's this whole middle ground of indifference or anger or or whatever that that leads to the rejection of of the truth of the gospel. Is that is that what you're talking about? Well, probably more specifically, we're speaking about those individuals who, have at, who actively reject the preaching of the gospel and fight against it and try to subvert it by appearing as friends or using covert means to get into the, into the pen, you know, to disrupt the flock. Uh, so when Jesus speaks his famous woes against the Pharisees in, uh, where is that? Isn't it in, like, uh, Matthew chapter 23? Uh, there Jesus is speaking about these men who know the Word of God, right? And yet they use the Word of God as a tool in which to uh, crush those people who would be saints and to profit themselves and their self-love, right? Mm -hmm. so, it's not, uh, so, they, so they hear the truth and they see the truth, but they're blind to it. And they, they're not only blind to it, they'll pick up the truth and use it as a weapon uh, uh, to serve themselves rather uh, to serve God. So, 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 this, this, so we yeah. nor I mean, again, to kind of push on this, just we normally think of the Pharisees. Well, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they did think that Jesus was the Messiah. They did see his miracles. They did. They did know that he was God in the flesh. At least a big portion of them knew that, and still they wanted to put him to death. Still, they wanted to kill him. It's not like they didn't. It's. It, there's, there, there are enemies of the gospel, people who believe and yet don't, don't have faith. They, 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 would, they would 
what consent to the assertions of the truth of Christianity, and yet they find themselves always op- opposing that. I'm sorry, I keep I keep pulling you back right. to that because I'm because I'm trying to get my head around it because we normally don't think. I mean, just even like for the evangelism of the church, we think that the people who are outside the church are outside the church because they don't believe in Jesus. They don't think that Jesus yeah. is God. And if I go and tell them Jesus is God, and then they believe that, then they'll come inside the church. But it's not that those are not the only two categories. The chief category is. Is not a belief. It's it's. Are you an enemy of of God or a friend of God? And the Pharisees have set themselves up as the enemies of God and of God's people, and they'll use the truth to fight against it, to fight right. against God. So we, they're, they're properly called demonic, because this is the way in which the demons know the truth of who God is and what He says. Right? They don't deny any of the assertions of that truth, but they're confirmed in their rage and hatred against it. And when the demons act in this world through, uh, uh, you know, false teachers and uh, through the, the weaknesses and uh, the sins of men, uh, it's easy to see how, mm. I think, like you said, these Pharisees would see confirmation after confirmation after confirmation that the whole world is going after Christ, uh, that he had proven beyond a doubt that he is the Son of God. The voice of the Father spoke and yet, they, in the same way as the devil entered Judas's heart, right, uh, to, to uh, uh, drive him to do this great act of betrayal against this man that he knew to be the Savior. So also, he was in the hearts of these, of these men, in the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, uh, to persecute Jesus, and finally, uh, uh, to arrange the plot with Judas to have him crucified. Hmm. But ironically enough, ironically enough, Jesus uses... Their hatred, their, their open-eyed hatred against the truth and against himself is, is, I think, a means to win them back to himself. Jesus is having this conversation with his enemies, with the men that are, uh, that are, that are actively persecuting the truth of God's word, right? Despite the fact that they know that this man was healed by the power of God on the Sabbath, which is a good and wonderful thing, and yet they hate it. And Jesus speaks to them in these gentle terms, explaining to them the things that they will not understand, uh, even though he speaks them plainly, until he is crucified and, and risen again, right? Uh, and and so, so Jesus, like I said, sharpens the metaphor to, uh, down to the point where he's no longer just speaking about illegitimate access to the sheep or uh, the thief and the robber, Instead, he says, the, he, he then speaks the truth that will, in fact, break the hardness of the malice, the demonic malice that infects men's hearts. When he says, the good shepherd, uh, uh, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Hmm. Uh, it, 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 I would not be surprised, in fact. Uh, I mean, we see this again and again in John's Gospel, that they speak with such malice and hatred against Jesus, pick up rocks to throw at him, and yet Jesus continues to speak the truth to them, and it's kind and merciful truth, right? When he says that uh, uh, if uh, if you only uh, hear my word and believe it, uh, you will have the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he gives them the beautiful doctrine of the Holy Trinity, right? But all of these things are joyous teachings, and yet they can only receive them as that which they have to hate. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Until finally, uh, I, I think that Jesus finds the way to break the hardness of, of, demonic, uh, of this demonic uh, uh, way, enslavement of men's hearts and, and minds and consciences through the cross. I would not be surprised if, if, uh, if in the very near future, where these same men who had been picking up rocks to throw at Jesus or who, who plotted with Judas to betray Jesus are, in fact, the men who will become Christians, you know, the first members of the church of Jerusalem. You just, I mean, there's always this distinction, I suppose, between the Jewish religious leaders and the early Christians. But at the same time, I, I would not be surprised at all if some of them, in fact, were won over to the Christian uh, uh, faith because of what Jesus does by laying his, down, his life down for the sheep and serving his sheep which is the house of Israel first through his death, his atoning death, which breaks not just, uh, which not only just forgives our iniquity before the Father, right? But it also breaks the, the death grip the devil has on our hearts. That's Even if it's a kind of death grip that drives men to hate the gospel. So this, this preaching, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, is, is preaching that's turning 
thieves and robbers into sheep of the good shepherd. <laughs> it's 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 fantastic. G- Jesus here in this new th- he he so when he says I lay down my life for the sheep, he's now going to contrast his good shepherding with the work of a hireling. And the hireling who doesn't own the sheep, but rather who someone who's you know this is kind of the rent a cop or so but it's just, just someone that's hired to look after a flock that's not his own and and now there's going to the contrast is going to be when the wolf comes the hireling runs for it but the good shepherd stays and fights so what's what's Jesus getting after there uh the fact that uh there's a distinction I like it that you were able to bring this out and I'm glad that you did that there's a real distinction between those who are actively trying to break into the church to disrupt the flock and those who have been given charge over the flock right and it's, it, again, it's not that they reject the truth uh, that there is a flock or there is a, a, a great shepherd that they're serving under, but rather when the moment of, of crisis or danger comes, by, it, they're driven by fear and self-preservation to throw down their rod and their staff, to throw down their sling and to run, you know, because they do not see the sheep as their own. They see themselves merely as, as uh, uh, there for a wage, you know, that I, I, I'm here doing a job so I can get a little bit of money so I can enjoy myself, as opposed to the true shepherds that Jesus desires, who see themselves as also uh, as, as also shepherds who ought to lay down their lives for the sheep, uh, which is the very same sermon that St. Peter preaches in the fifth chapter of his first epistle, right? Like in the same way as Jesus is the good shepherd, and he dies, and he sacrifices, and he suffers everything for the sake of the sheep, that he charges the rest of the pastors of Christ's uh, of, of Christ church, so also you must do the same. Suffer everything. Die for the sheep. Because uh, it's more than just a wage that you're working for. Uh, uh, Christ has obtained the wages of eternal life, which we have only by faith. Hmm. So uh, I remember, I mean, this is the sermon, First Peter 5, which is just beautiful. It almost brings tears to my eyes every time I read the text because it, it was the charge that was given to us, that was read to us as we left the seminary on call night. And and we now are going out, and we, we are transitioning from, from theological students to being pastors. And we have the charge to shepherd the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Uh, not begrudgingly, but with freedom and so forth. And, and this now becomes the instructions for pastors. But what, but what is that connection? I mean, how, how do we go from the good shepherd? Because there is only one good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. How do we go yes. from the, the singular good shepherd to the pastors that the Lord has called to, to, to look over and protect and feed and, and protect his sheep? It's when the risen Christ looks at St. Peter and says, feed my sheep. Hmm. That's when. That's when uh, Jesus, the, that's when Jesus yes, authorizes the sub pastoring. Is that what are we, the under is this, yeah. is this the under shepherd? I believe is not a biblical word, but it's a word that we often hear. Is this is that yes. what gets at it? I think so. I mean, the, so Jesus pays the price for the flock. He lays down his life for the sheep, and the sheep are thereby saved. They're saved from the wrath of God against their sin. They're saved from those same demonic attacks that we were talking about before. Uh, and, and they have protection and life on the foundation of the voice of the Good Shepherd, right? But the voice of the Good Shepherd doesn't come to us immediately, like in the silence of our bedroom in the middle of the night. Instead, Jesus says, it is a first order of business after his resurrection from the dead, after having taken up his life again, according to his own authority, he says to his disciples, go and forgive the sins of my saints, right? And, and he says, go and baptize them. And then he says to St. Peter, uh, feed my sheep, which means that I am not going to be doing it face-to-face with the flock. Rather, you are going to be my shepherds, right? Uh, uh, And so he brings to completion the promise that he made to the apostles at the very beginning. I'm going to make you fishers of men, that he is going to shepherd the flock through these fallible human instruments by speaking that, that, that same word, uh, uh, which which comforts us, which saves us, uh, that Jesus has invested with his divine power, right, to keep us safe from both the, the, the robbers, the thieves, and the wolves, 
uh, to, to, to keep us safe even from our own sins, right? We're delivered and kept safe from our sins by the voice of the Good Shepherd spoken through the mouth of his, of his pastors. This word, poi, the, the Greek word, poimain, now how, how is it? It can be translated either as sh- shepherd or as pastor. So when, when Jesus says, sh- uh, uh, pastor the flock of God, shepherd the flock of God, it's the same word, or it could be translated, I am the good pastor. How did we get how did we get those two different words into English? Why don't we just say shepherd? Uh well, I don't know. I mean, you remember that one show Firefly, science fiction, out like old old westy themed in the stars. You remember that? Uh is that the guy that had the guy who then was on Castle? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Well, anyways, what's nice about that show is that they had a parson on board. And their parson they called shepherd, huh. which is pastor. <laughs> so they always had the. So it was he wore a collar, you know, and he would. And, and he he wasn't Christian, I don't think, but he represented that 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 uh, the spiritual aspect of old American life, huh. where there was always a parson, there was always a shepherd there to help uh, guide morally and spiritually the lives of the flock under his care. And so even though we we hear the word pastor, we think of uh, a guy in, in a black shirt and a white collar. Uh, 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 to hear pastor and shepherd conflated easily is something that's not lost on the greater society. You know, they, they mm-hmm. see the connection between the two still. That's good. Now we're going to get a break in like one minute. So, but you just this weekend were with your dad, who's also a pastor and who is now finished his time in active ministry, and and you were there to and meditating on all of that sort of stuff. Uh, give us give us just some of the details of what you were up to, and then and then I let's let's push on that reflection a little bit in the last uh, in the last segment. Yeah, sure. So this uh, weekend I was here in Greenwood, Indiana, the town where I grew up, because my dad, who had been sa- serving at the same congregation for about twenty five years, uh, uh, was retiring from the holy ministry, and so I came to to hear his last sermon preached, where he was divinely called and. Uh, to attend the banquet afterwards, and uh, I gave a few remarks and also just enjoyed the company of my family and my friends that I had known in this place for a very, very long time. Well, let's talk about that, what it means to be a good shepherd in these gray and latter days, and especially what Jesus is talking about with the, him being the good shepherd and and uh, comparing himself to the hireling. We'll do that after the break. You're listening to Cross Defense. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmiller, and that's Pastor Brian Flammy on the other side over there. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is the day which the Lord has made. For the lonely and homebound, for the grieving and dying, and for all those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for me. Join us for a live broadcast of Chapel at the LCMS International Center weekdays at 10 a.m. on KFUO. Listening to KFUO on your smartphone is so easy to do. Smartphone assistant, play KFUO. Playing KFUO radio. You can also visit the place where you get your apps and download the KFUO app. You can also go to the KFUO homepage. Wow, the KFUO homepage is customized to fit your phone with an easy-to-find listening button. When you're on the webpage, you can browse for more information. You can listen to KFUO 24 hours a day at KFUO.org. Don't forget about Facebook, Facebook.com slash KFUO radio. Now you're just acting like a Hello, Cross Defenders. Thanks for listening to the show. I wanted to let you guys know, I this was, was reminded of the helpfulness of this uh, particular book the other day. The Doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church was published back a hundred and something years ago by Heinrich Schmid, and it's a compendium of all these great Lutheran thinkers uh, on, on all the various topics. It's, it's called the Doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and it was Pastor Flammy's secret how he knew more than me when we were pastoring Hope Lutheran Church together a few years back. Well, I found it, and I published it. You can download it for free or buy a copy on your own. We just recently published a hardcover version as well. You can find that at wolfmuller.co slash books and look for the Doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Click the free download button and enjoy the free theology there. It's fantastic.
Hey, welcome back to CrossFit. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolf. You're there. Pastor Brian Flame and I are talking about Jesus and his... It is stunning that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my... You just don't expect it. it I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. This is this, this surprise of the gospel where Jesus does this most astonishing thing. He hands himself over to the, to the wolves. To, so he's killed in our place. So that Jesus is the... He is the good shepherd, and at the same time, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he is the shepherd and the, the, the lamb. And then he takes his lambs, some of them, and makes them into shepherds. That's what we're talking about, this pastors who are to feed the flock of God and to shepherd and tend to it. Uh, we're talking about that especially with Pastor Brian Flammy, who is celebrating his debt. 25 years in one congregation. Um, that's that's a lot of years. That's fantastic. Yeah, it is really fantastic. I think it's kind of rare anymore. There's maybe a handful of folks that I know who have been that stable. It's much more common to hear about a pastor probably moving between parishes every uh, three to ten years, you know. And if you're able to stay at a parish for, for uh, ten years or uh, in that in that range, I mean, that's, that's considered to be uh, a, a guy who had been there long term. So, no, it's something remarkable, and it's good. I think it's good because it provided a kind of stability and peace that is necessary for Christ's church. Uh, or at least it's, uh, it's, it's not maybe, uh, I mean, it provides uh, a stability and a peace that is salutary to the preaching of the gospel, right? Uh, the, the, the baptizing and the confirming and the preaching of the word and uh, distribution of Jesus' body and blood in the supper, uh, these aren't to be done in a hurried or rushed manner, right? And, get, and having 25 years in the same place, getting into that routine is a good thing. It helps to ingrain uh, baptism and word and sacrament into our souls, right? Even digging those deep ruts, you know, <laughs> well, uh, in our souls so that we know where we're supposed to be on Sunday. I'm used to my shepherd. I know his voice. Uh, my ear starts to tune in to the kind of preaching that my pastor has, right? No, no two pastors are the same, and yet they preach the same word. I noticed this, I, at least when I went to my new call in Emmanuel Luther Church at Roswell, New Mexico, um, that it takes a little while, maybe a year or more, before the, the folks there started hearing what I was trying to preach. And it, it just takes some practice in listening to it, how your pastor rightly divides God's word and law and gospel, right? If you're not used to his little little idiosyncrasies or the or the tenor of his voice or the analogies that he likes to use, sometimes you lose more than maybe you catch. And so, having this kind of longevity in the church is is a wonderful gift. How does how does that work? Do you think? Because I, I, I notice it too, and I think you and I would talk about that a lot when you came here to Hope and we were preaching together. And now I'm thinking about it because I've. I've accepted another call, and I'm headed out in a few weeks down to Texas to to take up a new congregation there. And so I'm I'm thinking about that too. How how a congregation gets tuned into the to the how the ears get tuned to the preaching of the pastor. Yeah, I, familiarity with uh, the style of preaching and teaching. Uh, I mean, like I said, uh, you also get a kind of apprehensiveness, perhaps when when people have only had a pastor for a short period of time. Jesus says to beware of the wolves in sheep's clothing. And so I think rightly, <laughs> the congregations are, are wondering, do we have a wolf or is this an under shepherd uh, in sheep's clothing? You know, or, or, or <laughs> mm -hmm. what do we have with this guy? And so after a while, they learn to, to trust it, trust the man, not because he himself and his person is trustworthy. I mean, yes, that's a part of it, but because the voice that he preaches with is in fact Christ's voice. And because of that, they, they, they accept and love and, and appreciate all the things that he says. Like, you know how it is, and, and a pastor in preaching a sermon on Sunday morning, uh, uh, to make a particular point, he may ask for a bit of forbearance on the part of the congregation. It's easier to do that with a congregation that is, knows its shepherd's voice, as opposed to a guy who's only there for the very first time. Then, you know, the likelihood of people not, like, missing the point that he's trying to get to by by using the majority of the sermon to get there, that, that kind of generosity might be lost otherwise. There's a, we make this point a lot of times that every Christian 
must have a church. You can't. It is not safe to be trying to go at it alone. To to be to be an internet Christian, you know, to have a church. But you, you, it is not enough just to listen to cross defense every week. You got to have your own. You have to have your own congregation where you go. And with that, we we want to expand that and say it. Every Christian has to have their own pastor. It's not. Uh-huh. It's not safe to. And this is one of the problems with the mega church, where you have these huge congregations where the pastor has no idea who's even there, and uh, what what. How how can the, the man be a pastor? So people might say, "Well, I have a church, but I don't have a pastor." I, 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 if I had run into my pastor at Trader Joe's or whatever, you guys have a Trader Joe's down in Roswell? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you run into your pastor at the Trader Joe's, and you say, and he doesn't even recognize you or whatever. That that is not it's not a safe place to be spiritually. And now, so so press on that a little bit, like the the. The importance of having a uh, a, of each Christian having a pastor. Well, the difference is this: Uh, for my little farewell speech for my dad and the congregation uh, at the uh, at the banquet, you know, I I collected the stats for my dad's pastoral acts, you know, and I said, "Oh, my dad performed uh, like twenty eight marriages, or he buried close to two hundred saints, and he baptized nearly the same number, he preached this many sermons." But for every single one of those folks gathered in that room, uh, those were not mere numbers, but those were the, uh, their friends and their moms and dads and sons and daughters. You know, uh, that I, what, what I was speaking of as a number was to their hearing, hmm. uh, the saints of God that were shepherded through the works and the efforts of my dad. You see, that's the difference. Uh, that they had a con- pastor, they had this Christian conversation with their pastor uh, that 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 helped to sort out law and gospel, not just in the abstract, but in fact in their day to day life and their day to day interactions with uh, with their family and friends and workers. Uh, and so, my dad, in looking out over the congregation that was saying farewell to him yesterday, he didn't see a bunch of faces; he knew every single one of their names. And uh, he not only knew every single one of their names, but he knew all of the various spiritual struggles and, and tribulations that they were living through. And he had prayed with them and prayed for them. Uh, this is what my dad remembered was this passage from Philippians, right, where I keep you always in, 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 uh, in my mind or in my remembrance. I mean, that means, that means something to my dad, where he thinks individually about the saints, as having a name and having a personality that, that he knows intimately what's going on in their life so he can deliver the mercy and the blessings of the gospel to them. Uh, you can't have that if you just have a church but not a pastor, I think. That's wonderful. Well, so Okay, so what if someone's listening and they're thinking, okay, you guys got me convinced then. I, I maybe don't even have a church, but I need to get one. I gotta, but I, maybe I don't have a pastor. I need to find myself a pastor, be part of a particular church. What are you looking for? Uh, what what you need is a conversation. Uh, like I said, going to a church is more than just looking at the building, because I know plenty of fine churches with buildings that are pretty old and stinky. You know, it smells like mildew on the inside. I know plenty of terrible churches that are bright and shiny, and, and uh, it looks like, you know, the latest, greatest uh, uh, in corporate architecture. What you want is that pastoral conversation. And uh, hopefully, if you're moving from one place to another, your pastor helps to initiate that conversation with the pastor in the place that you're going to. If you don't know a pastor at all right now, instead of looking at the external like frame of the building or the architecture necessarily, go speak to the pastor. That should be at the, the very first thing on your agenda. And then ask him about uh, Jesus. Ask him to tell you about the scriptures. And that initiates the kind of spiritual conversation that will that will nourish you in this life. As the wolves try to come at you and attack, and as the false shepherds try to sneak in and steal, and even as the hirelings, because of fear, flee, right? In in initiating that that pastoral conversation, which is especially done by confessing your sins, right? And saying, now speak to me the absolution. That'll tell you everything that you need to know about the kind of shepherd that you have there. Mm. Uh, the, 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 The true good shepherds, 
who desire to be like their, their, the, the great shepherd, the great good shepherd Jesus, are going to be those ones who just can't wait to tell you the absolution for your deepest and darkest sins and guilt and shame. Hmm. That's fantastic. That's a, that's a, that's what Jesus said. Uh, forgive when he when he breathed on his disciples and he says, "Forgive them. Their, whoever sins, you forgive. They're forgiven them." That's how this is how it goes. All right, Pastor Flamey, yeah. the clock is gonna is gonna get to us again. So I want to make sure that you've we've talked about everything that um, that you want to talk about. What else is anything else that's on um that's on your mind? That's on my mind. Are you prompting me to talk about something I can't remember? Oh, nope. yeah, Game of nope. Thrones is on. You probably shouldn't watch that. <laughs> I uh, know, not Game of Thrones. I'm, I'm still thinking about. I'm still thinking about Jesus being the good shepherd. So, That's so, no, no, so. No, let me make this point. I got. I do have one thing, and that is uh, 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 that it, in the same way as Jesus, the good shepherd, lays down his life sacrificially for the sheep, right, by offering himself up as a propitiatory sacrifice to the Father. So also, the demons are going to come after your, your pastor, your shepherd. And, and invariably, if he preaches the truth of God's word, invariably, if he forgives people their sins, the demons will come, and they will try to make good on what Jesus said, that the good shepherd may, must lay down his life for the sheep. So just realize that. Realize that the good pastors are under spiritual attack on probably many different fronts. So they need your prayers. And they need your support, and uh, and they need the the voice of the sheep saying, "We desire to hear the voice of a good shepherd and not a hireling, who's going to give us whatever we think we need instead of giving us the truth that saves us." Right? Uh, and, and and so just just realize that that just because uh, Jesus lays down his life doesn't mean that his uh, under shepherds will also have to lay down their lives as well. And uh, it takes a real physical, mental, and spiritual toll on your pastor, and especially uh, after they've been in the office for any length of time, I think. I'm a baby pastor, so I, I, I've only begun to understand this. But a man who had been in the office for as long a time as my dad, he understands this much, much more accurately than I do, and with a much uh, deeper awareness of what it means to be attacked by the demons. And he we- thanked the saints yesterday for all their prayers on his behalf. You know, hmm. uh, realizing that he could not have fended off the demons on his own, but in fact, Jesus, in answering their prayers, defended him and protected him. That's fantastic. We strike. Uh, this is the Old Testament warning. Jesus, it comes in the New Testament. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. So the devil is always striking uh, at the Lord's pastors. But our protection for all of us, for pastors, for people, for all of us, our protection and our safety is in Christ the good shepherd who gives up his life for the sheep. We might we might die protecting the sheep, but Jesus is the one who gives his life up for the sheep. His, his is the life that atones. His is the blood that cleanses. His is the sacrifice that makes alive. He, the good shepherd, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which is your sin and mine. And he, by our baptism, by the gospel, by our faith in his promises, brings us into his singular flock, the eternal flock of Christ that recognizes his voice, that's called by name, and that rejoices in his presence. Pastor Flamey, thanks so much. Oh, man, it's been great. Thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have yeah, God, God be praised for the 25 years of ministry that your dad had, plus 25 plus years, 25 in one place. And, and may God continue to grant to his pastors and to his people this joy in speaking and hearing his word. It's an amazing sort of thing that... It gets back to where we started, that the speaking and hearing of God's word is where we, we find our life. It's a, the sheep are not, not good for much. You know, they, don't, they don't have big, sharp teeth. They don't have any strong... They're not that fast. They're not ferocious. They're kind of... They're gentle and they're mild. They're, they're, in other words, they're lunch without a shepherd. But Jesus has provided himself as our shepherd. And he's given us pastors so that we might live and rejoice in his kindness and know his voice and clinging to it, find life in his name. Thanks for listening to Cross Events. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, a pastor of Hope Lutheran Church here in Aurora, Colorado, and I'm glad to come, uh, come to you every single week rejoicing in the Lord's mercy, in the kindness of our Lord Jesus, who has risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. Thanks for listening. God's peace be with you.
Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org. Thanks again for listening to Cross Defense. We hope that every week this is a time of joy and peace for you and hearing the Lord's Word and rejoicing in the care of Jesus, our Good Shepherd. I'm, again, your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, and I'm simply delighted to have this time uh, with you, with our Bibles open and the Lord's Word comforting and giving us peace. If you've got any feedback, any ideas, any any criticism, any uh, kind words, you can share all that in the contact form at Wolfmuller. Dot co. It's W-O-L-F-M-U-E-L-L-E-R dot C-O. And you'll find a lot of other stuff there, audio, video, theology, blogs, stuff like that, Bible studies. So uh, check it out. It's all for free. It's all for you. Thanks. We'll talk to you next week. God's peace be with you.